Yes, sir. <laughs> you spoke of the exclusivity of Christianity and um, the notion that we can only truly come to know God through knowing Jesus. Um, I'm sure in your travels you've been to many places where a lot of the people haven't even heard of Jesus Christ, much less seen a Bible. I'm just wondering whether God gives all the people of the earth the possibility to know uh, God through Jesus, and if so, how does he do it? Here's what I want to read for you from Acts chapter 17. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth and he determined the time set forth for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us. Your question is a very deep question which has been asked for many many uh, decades uh, we ask it I ask it as a proclaimer sometimes I go into a city or a place where people have not heard anything like what you're presenting we hear them say that and so on God reminds us in his word and in many illustrations of history that he is able to bypass even the human mechanism in order to speak to men and women and he does this not only through public proclaimers now with the television and media and the written page and all of that uh, people can read about him in, in various places never having heard a preacher or never having come into contact with the church or whatever and one of the most remarkable things and I want to tell you this uh, one of the most remarkable things I've heard as I travel is the parts of the world in which God has spoken many times through dreams and visions. It's happened in India, it's happened in Iran, it's happened in places of the world that I could name for you. And let me give you just one simple illustration to sustain what I'm saying because it only demonstrates for us that he is near people who truly call upon him. I was in, um, in a country, I'll have to leave this unnamed, but my wife and I were invited for dinner by a man who came from a very troubled part of the world, the majority, 99 point something percent of whom are Muslim people. And this fellow asked if he could have dinner with us. He'd read some of my books and a Chinese Christian businessman brought him to meet my wife and me. It's such a fascinating story that it's worthy of repetition here. He only introduced himself with a name that he said, it's not my real name. He said, I belong to the army of my country. I have been trained to kill without feelings. So that was my training. My brother is a general in that army. He said, Mr. Ravi, for seven years in a row every night I had a dream of Jesus. He said, seven years in a row I had the dream and my mother told me, get out of here or your brothers will kill you. He said, I'm not going to become a Christian. She said, that's all right. You're having this dream. They'll see what's going to happen. You get out of here. He said, I left there and I have arrived here, met this Chinese businessman. He talked to me. We became friends. He said, I have committed my life now to Jesus Christ. The question is a profound one. But I truly and sincerely believe what the Bible says. You shall search for me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. It is not the volume of content that you need. As much of the intent on your heart that cries out and says, God, I need you, save me. And I believe he reveals Christ to you, principally through his word or through some other person or through a vision or through a dream and brings you to himself. There's a book written called Persian Springs which counts a dozen different testimonies in the same way that I've given to you. So I just say to you that as rich a question as it is, God has ways of reaching people, and I truly believe the judge of all the earth will do right. To whom much is given, much shall be required. And I think God will judge you in the light of what he has revealed to you and what you know to be true. Honey, how are you, my friend? Very good. Kya <laughs> 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 I'm glad you're back. Yeah. I like um, you. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, all right. The, the Christian faith stresses a lot of love, a lot of forgiveness. And you were just speaking to that gentleman about how he will judge everybody rightly. However, what really troubles me is this. Christian dogmas all concur on this one thing, 
that all of us are born with this original sin. Correct. This thing that we just inherited from Adam, and we are just born with it when we're born. And then when Jesus talks about it, and he's in the crowd, everybody's asking, how do we inherit the kingdom? He brings a little child and puts him on the throne. It says you have to be as innocent as that child to inherit the kingdom. He never said it. Nothing about original sin, nothing about the Trinity, him being God. He stressed two things, that love thy, thy Lord, my father and your father, and love thy neighbor. That's the only thing he came up with. But the reality is that when you look at Jesus, you see, first of all, what he said to the people who refused to come to him. He told them that they were of their father, the devil. When he talked about the human condition, he very clearly described it. And you go all the way through the Sermon on the Mount, and you will see that the standard that he set is impossible for any human being to attain. And he said also very clearly, as he described very precisely in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 3, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and there is not even one righteous, no, not one. If you believe that statement, you must believe that what the Apostle Paul is telling us there is precisely what he understands the Christian to be, one who is a sinner. Now, the reason you do not believe in the very sinful uh, reality of the human mind and the human fallen condition is because you also do not believe as a Muslim that man is created in the image of God. Isn't that not, is that not right? Yes, it is. Okay, and that therefore you have absolutely at that point no way to even explain the moral framework. So the moral framework that you actually argue about comes to you from where? It comes from the Quran mainly. Okay. However, I do believe in the scriptures. I do believe in the gospel of Jesus. I really think that nobody is perfect. That's what I believe. Nobody is perfect. Yes. Okay, Except then God. how do they find forgiveness? Forgiveness is something that only God can grant. That is correct. Yes. So we are on equal keel, or even keel now. There is none righteous, no not one, nobody is perfect, so nobody in his her condition can inherit the kingdom of God. Only God can make that decision to give it to you. All right? Yes. Jesus says, if any man come unto me, I will in no wise cast out. He that hath the Son has life, he that has not the Son has not life, but shall come into condemnation. When as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of the living God, even to them that call upon his name. Now he goes into that tremendous conversation with Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is the ruler and the teacher of the Jews and so on. And he is talking about all that he knows. And Jesus looks at Nicodemus and says, you are a teacher and you don't know that it is impossible for you to get into the kingdom without the new birth, without being born again. And here he makes a very categoric statement that I want to read for you because I think that will answer the question and I trust will at least be on an even keel by that statement. Here it is. As he is dealing with Nicodemus, here he says to Nicodemus here, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. And what he is saying is, everyone born of the flesh cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That spiritual birth needs to take place. And he goes on to say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So my answer to you, honey, is this. You believe none of us is perfect. We are all imperfect. The Bible calls that falling short of the standard of God. So if you don't want to accept the uh, original sin, you then have to explain why none of us is perfect. And none of us has that capacity to be perfect. 
Original sin basically means that in my own condition, I'm not able to come to God and meet his complete righteousness, no matter how hard I try, and many of them tried. All this means is that in my strength and in my ability, it is impossible for me to attain the kingdom of God. He's made the way. He died on the cross. History demonstrates that. And when he died on that cross, three days later, he rose again. He offers you eternal life, honey. And you are not perfect. I am not perfect. God is perfect. He is the only one. And he's giving you his son through whom you and I can be seen as perfect in his sight. We've all sinned. He provides the way. And a new birth is recognized only when that spirit comes and changes what you want to do. And I hope that will happen to you one day too. You've traveled to another dimension, a dimension not only of contradiction and speculation, but also one that defies logic and is based on blind faith, a journey into a nebulous land whose limits are that of imagination. You've just crossed over into the evolution zone.